One thin September soon, a floating continent disappears in the midnight sun. Vapours rise as fever settles on an acid sea. Neptune's bones dissolve. Snow glides from the mountain, ice fathers floods for a season. A hard rain comes quickly. Then dirt is parched, kindling is placed in the forest for the lightning celebration. Unknown creatures take their leave, unmourned. Horsemen ready their stirrups. Passion seeks heroes and friends. The bell on the city, on the hill is rung. The shepherd cries, the hour of choosing has arrived. Here are your tools. Now, we, we've all heard this story of climate change. It's a story of apocalypse, of despair and fear, of an ever darkening world. And it's a story which forecasts a dire planetary future and it diminishes human agency when we're pitted against the indomitable forces of nature. And in these stories there's a sense of inevitability, that things will go wrong, that we act too late or not at all. And it's a story not unique to climate change but with similar narratives for global pandemics, nuclear disaster, mass migration even, they are all seen as insurmountable obstacles, especially when they start converging. But in a way, these crises are quite normal and not that scary. Why? Because our response to these man-made crises is part of a natural process Yes, there is a big danger here if we don't act right, but there's no need to panic. In fact, we sometimes need a crisis now and then to get us to cooperate. What am I talking about? Let's have a read of the evolutionary tea leaves. Or not. The story of humanity is a story that unfolds to reveal ever larger scales of governance and cooperation, from families and hunter-gatherer hunter bands to tribes, from there to middle-aged city-states, and then to the nation-state model which we're familiar with today, and then to supranational bodies such as the EU and the UN. Now we're all familiar with this stripped-back story of human evolution, from the local to the national to the global. Within these groups, we get us and them dynamics, and they define different groups of cooperation at these different levels. And as evolution pushes us to the limit of the next level, the competition between these groups starts to become destructive. Now, that transition from each governance level is never smooth, and throughout history there's been a great deal of conflict. Sometimes groups of cooperation collapsing and devolving back to a previous state before finally ascending to that higher and more stable level of cooperation. But the message here, which is clear to see, is that when we group together, when we collaborate, we can achieve more as a collective rather than as individuals. Cooperation outweighs selfish interest and helps foster these ever greater levels of governance as cooperation only succeeds when it's in the immediate self-interest of everyone in the group, that the group does well, whether that be that the hunter-gatherers find enough food, the city-state produces a bumper wheat crop, or the nation-state wins a space race. So what's driven this expansion? New technology and innovation enable these changes and create a new context for governance at an ever larger scale. The agricultural revolution has led to the development of city-states. The printing press in 1440 ushered in a new wave of modernity as the printed word revolutionised the way we perceive the world around us. And most recently, the internet has enabled effortless global communication and business. Now, these different levels are also a reflection of how we think, from egocentric to ethnocentric to nation-centric to world-centric. 
And the problem that we have right now is that we have a governance gap. We mostly operate via the national level, but our society, our thinking, and climate change are international. The world is moving so fast that there is a lag in effective governance. So a governance gap exists for climate change because it is the actions of individual and competing nation states which is causing a problem for us all, but for some more than others. Now, remember this simple story about ever larger scales of governance? Well, a similar scale of expansion exists for environmental problems. The first very simple problem was something like one upstream Neolithic village which started defecating in the stream, which caused a great deal of distress for downstream village B and C. Now, before the crisis, these independent groups would display us and them dynamics. But the crisis would force these two independent communities of B and C to interact, collaborate, and confront their common enemy, village A. Now, B and C become this new collaborative unit and a larger scale of governance is formed. As time moves on, when village D decides to build a dam upstream of A, B and C, then village A might decide to join forces with B and C to confront a greater threat. And so it goes on. So climate change and other global issues are just the latest manifestation of these age-old problems. They are global in nature, though, as that is the modus operandi of our current human story. The only thing different is the scale. Each nation state is now polluting the stream. So, who has heard of the Paris Agreement? We'll do a classic show of hands. Has anyone heard of it? I know some people have, but this sounds they came with me. Um, Okay, uh, so last December we reached a crucial moment in the global cooperation, which was the Paris Agreement. Now, this was a UN meeting, COP21, at the end of last year, and it was the largest ever gathering of heads of state under one roof. And this two-week conference concluded with the creation of this document, the Paris Agreement, this magnificent plan to tackle climate change, which 189 nations signed up to and submitted their carbon reduction pledges. The aim of the agreement, to limit global warming to no more than two degrees and to have net zero carbon by the second half of the century. Now, the agreement has been described as historic, as it is really unique to get this level of international cooperation on an issue. And a lot of people, myself included, were asking the day after this agreement was signed, is this this? Is this the plan we've been looking for to tackle climate change after Kyoto and Copenhagen failed? And the headlines since? More oil exploitation planned for just south of London at Gatwick. In this week's budget, massive tax relief for the oil and gas sector. Some countries' carbon reduction plans actually includes prioritising coal as an energy option. And Saudi Arabia are seeking compensation for not being able to exploit their oil reserves to the maximum agreement under the agreement. So, although there are some positive stories, the stories I've just mentioned really tease out that we're not really all in this together, are we, tackling climate change? And looking at these events, you could actually be forgiven for thinking that nothing actually was agreed at Paris. You see, Paris outlines the very first cautious steps towards sustainability, but there is an awful lot of hedging. There are no, there are no major players which are taking great leaps towards a low-carbon future, despite pretty much all of us now recognise that it is the only rational future, economically, environmental and otherwise. But with emissions higher than feared, each successive month breaking new temperature records, perhaps then Paris was a flicker of light in the darkness, rather than this illuminating moment. 
So what sort of cooperation did we see at Paris? I think it's shallow cooperation. Now this is where everyone agrees to do the same thing. It's a stag hunt scenario and game theory. Now this works very well on single issues if everybody's interests are the same, as things get done fast. But with climate change, immediate interests aren't the same, which is why Paris progress is going to be slow rather than radical. It's not seen to be in each country's immediate interest to drastically cut carbon now, as some countries still want some quick and dirty fossil fuel driven growth. And other nations don't want to radically cut emissions without these developing nations on board, because that would undermine their national competitiveness. So we can't wait for this shallow cooperation to slowly pan out and deliver emission reductions over time, as we're up against a tight climate time limit. So what's the alternative? What is deep cooperation? This recognises divergent interest and that single issue negotiations creates winners and it creates losers. Deep cooperation mixes issues together to get agreeable outcomes. It is a golden rule of international relations for losers on one issue can be compensated with winning on another. And the more issues, the more trade-offs. And this deal is introduced simultaneously so everyone moves in sync, so no players are left behind. So what does this look like, this deep cooperation look like in relation to climate change? We need to make it in each country's immediate interest to cut emissions now. So as we establish through single issue negotiations, this produces winners and losers. We can't get each country signed up to drastically cut carbon now. But if another issue was negotiated in parallel to carbon reduction, what one country lose on the climate deal, it could win on the other issue. And this other issue could be something like a global transaction tax, renegotiated trade tariffs. Uh, a worked out example of what this looks like is SIMPOG, which is a simultaneous policy. And this is this mechanism to bring about this deep cooperation for climate change. And at the last UK general election, they actually had 630 parliamentary candidates signed up to this, which translated into 30 MPs. Now, this deep cooperation, where multiple issues are mashed together, isn't dissimilar to what we have at a nation-state level, with so many policy trade-offs that citizens lose on some, win on other, but generally everyone's quite content. But cooperation often comes with necessity. Village B and C simply couldn't live with a polluted stream. But climate change is a more difficult stimulus, however, to force this cooperation, as it's not enough of a crisis yet. The wicked part of the problem, obviously, being that when it is an insurmountable challenge to enough nations. It will be too late to do anything about it, and national competitiveness counts for very little. As we've seen from our human story, evolution is pushing us towards ever larger scales of governance and cooperation. Sometimes deep cooperation only comes about because of a crisis which can damage all players, such as a polluted stream. Now this next level of planetary-wide cooperation would naturally come about in the face of an external force to our community, such as aliens. If we encountered an extraterrestrial civilization, then humanity as an entire global unit would become a collaborative group, the us, <coughs> and the aliens would become the them. Now, this would, would, this would replace the more trivial boundaries we currently have of nation-states, and cooperation would be in our best interest as a planet when interacting with the aliens. However, without aliens, we need to force this evolution to help cooperation go the way it would naturally go, given enough time. We need to preempt this next evolutionary step as the climate clock is ticking down. 
If it wasn't climate change, it would be some other issue which is pushing us to the limit of planetary crisis. In times of crisis, we are either pulled up to the next evolutionary step or we slip down. And it may seem daunting to us now, this idea of global cooperation, but it's no more daunting than the transition from the middle-aged city-state to the nation-state we have today. So, although Paris looked a whole lot like global cooperation, it's actually pretty shallow. It does show that a global deal on this level is possible, but it moves too slowly towards action, as it's not in each country's immediate interest to tackle climate change by radically cutting emissions. Aside then from preempting this next evolutionary step towards deep global cooperation, our best chance of solving climate change is encountering alien life within the next few years. Live long and prosper.